And I wanted people like Sophie to be able to access my reporting. But I knew the typical way we report and publish stories wouldn't be enough to make that happen. Tonight, we're going to share those stories with you. We tried a few things to make the stories accessible, including plain language translations. I'm gonna pass it back to Maya now, who's going to show you an example of what that looks like. Kyra Wade's favorite color is pink. The 11 year old likes road trips and the movie Monsters, Inc. She loves to watch people laugh. Her culinary preferences run to noodles and rice. Beyond that, her parents don't know much about her needs and wants. Kyra is autistic and profoundly deaf. Kyra Wade is 11 years old. She likes the color pink, the movie Monsters, Inc., watching people laugh, noodles, and rice. Kyra's parents don't know what else Kyra likes or wants. Kyra is autistic and no. deaf. All right, Amy, uh, you're on mute, I think. It's not, it's not a Zoom event without that, right? Becca Monteleone, who will be joining us later in the hour, translated these stories into plain language. Later in the event, we'll also have Shoshana Gordon, a production fellow at ProPublica, the artists at Make Studio, who created illustrations for the event, and Mumta Popat, <clears throat> a photographer for the Arizona Daily Star. Bina and Maya, you just saw them, are engagement reporters with ProPublica and will be helping run the Zoom so you might see them pop into the screen or answer your questions. Over the next hour, we also want to hear what you think of our reporting and whether you have any more stories for us. We're holding this event to not only present our stories back to you, but also to understand what feedback and questions you might have. At any time, if you want to share something with us tonight, you can send, us, send it to us in the Zoom chat. If you want to tell us something privately, you can also call our reporters and leave us a voice message at any time. The number is 520-329-7530. Again, that number is 520-329-7530. Also a note that this event is on the record, meaning we are recording this event and we'll post it online publicly and anything said during the event may be quoted and published in stories. So that means if you'd like a copy or want to screen this to a community, like a day program or a group home, we're happy to do that. Just send a note in the chat. I also want to give a shout out to Don, who's doing our ASL interpretation tonight. So Kyra was one person we featured. Now we want you to meet Emery. We want to first show you how we told her story. So we're going to play a few parts of our plain language story. Great, and I'm about to share my screen with everyone again uh, so that we can go to uh, see Emery and Adiba's story. Emery Webster is 11 years old. She lives in Tucson, Arizona. Emery wants to be a DJ. She pretends to beatbox and scratch records. Emery's mom said, Miss Emery is a little firecracker. She is sassy as the day is long, but she's also one of the sweetest kids ever and funny. Oh God, she has such a sense of humor. It's ridiculous. Emery has cerebral palsy. It is hard for her to talk to other people. Emery uses a device that helps her talk to other people. Her device is from the Division of Developmental Disabilities. Emery's mom says Emery's device is old and broken. Emery had to wait one and a half years to get a new device. DDD told her she could get a new device this summer.
Maya, you're on mute. I'm sorry, I'm unmuting myself. Um, thank you. After the uh, story was published, uh, Emery and Adiba heard from DDD and actually after a year and a half got a new device. So last uh, week, uh, Bina and Amy interviewed Emery and Adiba who couldn't join us tonight. So we're gonna be playing a clip from that interview. Uh, so please stay tuned. And then afterward, we'll come back and Amy will lead us in, a, in an interview with another um, couple folks. And at any time, if you all have any thoughts, uh -huh. uh, wanna share your feedback or um, want to also have the opportunity to bring some of these stories back to your community and be ambassador of the, ambassadors of this journalism, feel free to text the number that you'll see in the chat that Bina will put in. So uh, stepping out of the pages of the Arizona Daily Star are Emery Webster and her mom, Adiba Nelson, uh, who live in Tucson. And Sorry, I'm hearing there's no sound. Yeah, Maya, I think you might need to reshare. Yes, I will reshare. One second. Thank you all for your patience. Yeah, my yeah, my suit is off and on. Oh, and if someone is on mute, could they if they could off mute, could, if they can mute themselves, that would be great. All right, we're gonna try this again. So uh, stepping out of the pages of the Arizona Daily Star are Emery Webster and her mom, Adiba Nelson, uh, who live in Tucson. And uh, yeah, so uh, it's already been established that Adiba may or may not be allowed in the screen, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so the story came out um, on a Friday and, and then when did you get the device? So I think it came out online on Friday and it came out on the Sunday paper. <laughs> what is happening? Sorry. <laughs> it came out in the paper in print here on Sunday. And I got a text message from our DDD coordinator Monday <laughs> afternoon saying, hey, guess what? It just got an email that your device is in. I was like, oh, funny how that worked out. It was, there's just an article that went live and she was like, yeah, we know. <laughs> We've been getting calls all there, I got a lot of messages from people and I think this started as well and ProPublica who wanted to purchase a device, but it's not that easy. No, right? Exactly. Uh, the device is your typical tablet. It's all of the software and the programming that goes into it. It felt, it felt good to be getting the story out there, just about not only what M was dealing with, but knowing that there were other kids that you were talking to and what they were dealing with. Like Arizona as a whole does um, pretty good when it comes to disability services. When I talk to parents in other states who have kids that are disabled and they're like, you get what? You get what? What? How does that happen? Um, so in that regard, I'm always like, okay, like, you know, guess we're never leaving Arizona. <laughs> um, but then you hear stories like this and it's just like, but we still have a lot of work to do. Like there, that shouldn't have happened. There's no reason that that, hap that happened the way it did. Um, and so for that reason, I'm really glad that there was some light shed on it. I don't know if changes are going to be made. From what I hear, it sounds like there are some changes being made. There's still a lot of talk um, around DDD and DES about this specific situation. Um, they're still getting phone calls and emails about it. And wanting to know what's going on, where did the ball drop, trying to like uh, follow the trail to figure out where it happened specifically. Um, but we'll see if anything actually comes from that. One of the things that we really wanted to do with this project was focus our coverage specifically on the people with disabilities themselves. 
Mm -hmm. um, both in terms of the reporting and then also the uh, adaptations we did, the plain language translation, Bina did audience. What'd you think of that? Or I'm sorry, audio versions. I thought it was brilliant. I've never, ever, ever in my life seen reporting done in such an accessible way. Like never in life. And like we get books from school for Emory that are adaptive. Um, so they're just a little bit easier to understand. It's not so wordy, you get the gist of it, kind of like cliff notes type things. But I've never I've never seen that in the editorial space. Um, I felt like I really understood <clears throat> what uh, not only the parents were trying to get across, but also the humanity of the individuals that were being discussed. Um, I definitely felt that. Um, Quiet. Man, Adiba, you are going to rue the day that thing arrived at your house. I already do. <laughs> I have been told I'm impossible. I have been told to go away, be quiet. <laughs> yeah. I get it from both my kids. I completely but, relate. You know, at the same time, though, it's just confirmation that she's just a typical kid. And it gives her the freedom and the, the uh, liberty to be a typical kid. It gives her that humanity that all other kids have. Um, different. Who's different? You're different? No. I'm different? Um. You want me to be quiet differently? Yeah. I'm, I would really love to see what the talker looks like. Could you show it to us? Yeah. Okay, show them what it looks like. You wanna put it back on its main screen? Okay, put it on its main screen. Okay, now show them. Can you show Bina? Mm -hmm. Oh, hold it cool. Up. There you go. Let me see if I can get a little bit closer. There you go. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on on that home screen? Okay. So what's happening here, Em? <gasps> oh, let's, what does it have? Does it just have, let's write out what it has. Where's your keyboard? Oh, this hand? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, where's your keyboard there? So what do you use the main screen for? E. Uh-huh. P. Uh-huh. A. Uh-huh. What EPA what? Mm -hmm. I don't know what word you're trying to spell here. M. Uh huh. Oh, are you trying to spell that? Yeah. Example. She's trying to spell example. Okay. So you use the main screen to give examples? Yeah. Um, but it's, it's realistic in the sense of it gives you topics, like real topics that every, everyone talks about. And that was one of the things I loved about it the most is that when her teacher showed it to me or her speech therapist showed it to me, I noticed immediately, and I was like, wait, what? It has a sexuality button because disabled people have sex too. And they're curious about it and they have thoughts about it. And when you click on it, I mean, it literally, <laughs> is it safe? Can you explain that? Should I call my doctor? Do you love me? Like, these are real things that people talk about. And for someone who has um, barriers to communication and um, issues with forming full sentences with their own voice, because maybe cognitively their brain cannot put the words together in the correct order for them, this is brilliant. This is brilliant. And granted, she's 11, so mm -hmm. better not be pressing any of these buttons. <laughs> but when she's 18, 19, 20, you know, I, she might have a partner and she might want to say, you. I trust you. You know, th this is, this is reality. This is, this is actually providing dignity and humanity to people that are very often not afforded that. 
So we're very happy with it to say the least. Is there anything else that you want, um, you know, the, the attendees at our event to know? Yeah, this. Oh, say that again. Say that again. Hold on. I like. Nope, you missed that one. That was the one. You want me to do it? Mm. I don't know. I get my question yet. We love talking about it with you too, Emery. Thank you so much. Is there anything else that you'd like yeah. to say to them? What would you like to say? Do you remember me? I do remember you. And Bina knows all about you because she did amazing audio recordings of your story. Yeah, so you're, they know who you are, kiddo. You're famous. <laughs> oh, don't say that, Bina. Don't say that. I have to live with this. <laughs> don't do that to me. <laughs> you, you are a little famous. So <laughs> Okay, anything else you'd like to say? Yeah. What else would you like? Tell to say? me more. <laughs> See? <laughs> so yeah, how famous and awesome you are? Yeah. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> what else would you would you like to um, ask a question? Would you like to tell them something? What are we doing here? Where are we going? Here? Okay. And where? Okay, and now what? Uh, I agree. That you're famous? Yeah. Well, there you go. What can you do? We are very lucky that you were able to find time to speak with <laughs> Miss Emery. Oh, you think that's funny? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what did you say? Uh, can you say it again? No, the, the first thing you said. Hey, you. I don't know if you understood that. No. Right, well, hey, you. Thank you. Yeah. It was our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so that was uh, Amy and Bina's interview with Adiba and Emery last week. Um, they, again, for those who didn't read the story, they uh, had to wait a year and a half to get that device that we uh, spoke with Emery and Adiba about in that, um, in that interview. Um, yeah, and so if, if you guys, again, have any thoughts or feedback as you were listening to that or um, consuming it, feel free to text us the number, the 520-329-7530. Um, if it inspired you to share your own stories, also feel free to share your stories with us. Um, and also, if you want to bring these stories back to your community, we also have the opportunity to do that. Um, so next, I'm going to be sharing my screen with you only for a couple more minutes, and then we'll have a live interview between Amy and uh, BJ and Drew, who were featured in uh, Amy's series. And so I'm going to share my screen with you again. We'll have an audio snippet of the story for those of you who haven't read it. Um, and then we're going to switch over to Amy, BJ, and Drew for an interview. Drew Bolander is 41 years old. He lives in Phoenix, Arizona with his mom. His mom's name is BJ. Drew likes weightlifting, video games, the band Green Day. Drew has hydrocephalus and brain damage. Hydrocephalus means there is extra liquid in Drew's brain. Drew has seizures, too. Drew's mom may have to stay up all night to help Drew. She worries about who will help Drew when she dies. Drew thinks about dying, too. Drew was interviewed for this story. He was friendly and talkative. He had a big smile and light brown hair. Sometimes he started sentences he didn't finish. Drew said he wants to stay alive as long as possible. He wants to have a gold casket when he dies. Drew's mom said he really likes one song. Drew's mom said to listen to the lyrics. Not that song.
So Amy um, and yes. BJ and Drew, you're, yeah, there you go. We're on, Great. all right. BJ and Drew, thank you so much for being with, here with us today. And it looks like you have someone else with you as well. This is Gladys. She's one of our wonderful caregivers and she was here when Mumta, the photographer came. I think you were there too when I when I spoke with uh, Drew and BJ. Yeah, we go way we go way back. All right, so um, BJ, we were wondering um, if you would tell us a little bit about how you found out about the this project we were working on and got involved. <laughs> It was uh, funny because I like to use social media and I'm very active and it's a good thing considering we have the pandemic now because that's my social life. But I've known um, people online for many years, never met them, never talked to them on the phone, but, and um, I decided to become active in Twitter and actually I uh, signed up to get post tweets from ProPublica, but I would get them every so often, but I missed the important one. And one of my friends from 12 years, she messaged me and says, BJ, BJ, there's something going on with ProPublica and I think it's right up your alley. And so she sent me the link to the tweet from ProPublica. And so I sent in our information right away got an email right back, and then Amy and I and Drew started talking. So Drew, tell me um, a little bit about what it felt like to be interviewed and have a story written about you. Uh, pretty uh, kind of good. Was it, was it painful? Was it a painful process? Or was yeah, it okay? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of good and kind of pain. pain. Kind of pain. painful to talk about things that are hard. You want to tell us a little bit about why that song by Green Day is meaningful to you? Uh, no, not, not, not really that. That's well, he likes favorite. another one also. Oh, do yeah. you have a new favorite? That was a few weeks ago. He also likes Boulevard of Broken Dreams, right, Drew? Yeah. And the lyrics are similar. You got a thumbs up from Rosie over there. Um, I'm not familiar. Is that Green Day as well? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. He yeah. listens very carefully to the lyrics, right, Drew? Yeah. Um, can you, BJ, do you, have any, um, do you have any updates for us uh, since the story ran? Um, it's kind of interesting. I don't think I am ever going can, to can find I, out. Can I, can I tell you something? Wait, I got to answer this first can and then you can. Okay. Can, can I tell you something? Me, wait. Um, no, no, it's okay. If you don't mind being interrupted. That's okay. okay. What's up, Drew? Wait, when the, the, the P word happened, the pandemic, pandemic. happened, uh, everybody, Everybody flipped out when I uh, when I when I when I said we're all still alive here in Phoenix tonight when when they were playing that. He's thinking about the time he went to a Green Day concert. I miss concerts, don't you, Drew? Is that the last concert you saw? Yeah, I, th yeah. I think so. The last concert I saw was Lizzo. I feel like that's probably a good last concert, right? Yeah. yeah. Are you familiar with Lizzo? No, not, not really. I think you and your mom might like her. I'll send you guys some links. All right, so back to the conversation. Okay. Yeah. Can, can we let your mom talk now? Yeah. Okay. Um, I was surprised, but I was kind of nervous because of the timing when this would come out. Because um, starting in the middle of May, we had a big problem with TDD. And it was trying to keep our hours for the caregivers. And we had a, a fairly new and experienced support coordinator. And it was clear that he was being told, do whatever it takes to cut our hours. <laughs> 
So it was a very difficult situation and our annual meeting that DDD uses called an ISP, Individual Service Plan. Um, it was supposed to be that meeting in May. And because they were trying very hard to cut our hours, because it saves a lot of money, <laughs> um, that meeting was in May. Phone calls, whoops. You still there? Yeah, we're here. Then there were phone calls in June and July. And in August, we had the second part of the meeting and there were phone calls in August and September. And so the end of September, we had the third part of the meeting. And the meeting had to be by video. So it one meeting took six and a half hours over four and a half months. And it was very touchy and very upsetting. It involved a, a great deal of work on our part with documentation. And so I was very nervous when the article would come out because I, I was nervous would there be a retribution of some sort. On the bright side, right when the article actually came out because it went longer, um, the, it came to a head and I actually called a, a big manager, program manager, a big one, and told her what was happening. And within one week, we had a brand new coordinator and a brand new supervisor. And gosh darn, if it wasn't one meeting and we had all our hours. So um, can I, sh I should, can I interject for a second? Yeah. I should say, um, we did run, you know, your story by DDD, and it was it was before that happened. I have no idea if that had anything to do with with uh, what happened, but I wanted everyone to know that we did ask them for a response, and they they didn't respond on uh, to any individual cases. Okay, it's possible that the big high up person may have heard that this um, report was being worked on. But I think it was more a matter of I was able to get to the right person and speak plainly yeah. and she helped. Um, Bina and Meyer are taskmasters about the time. So I want, we're, we're almost out of time for our segment, but I, I wanted to um, end with Drew. Drew, is there anything you want us to know about your life? Or about anything else? I'm trying, I'm trying as, as hard, as hard as I can, as hard as I can to, as hard as I can to. Hang in there? Yeah, hang in there. And, Yeah. Well, I hope you do. I hope you do. Hey, you um, and bye. thank you both I, so I much. I have a question. She's going to go. Okay. I, I have a question. If you could come back to me before the end of the whole thing, I do have something I want to share with the other parents. Okay. Well, well, I'll, I'll talk to, I'll talk to the people um, in charge. Okay. Hey, bye, Drew. Thank you both to you both so much, mm -hmm. so much. Um, so now that you've met the people our stories are about, we want to tell you a little bit more about how we did the stories. You've seen this beautiful artwork in our slideshows, and we're going to talk to Shoshana Gordon at ProPublica, uh, Mamta Popat, who's a photographer for the Arizona Daily Star, plus Stefan Bauschmid, I got pronunciations and still butch butchered your names, I apologize. Okay. Rosie Eck, Kareem Samuels, and Erica Clark, who are all artists and staff with Make Studio in Baltimore, Maryland. Thank you all so much for joining the conversation. Over to you, Shosh. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, like, like Amy said, my name is Shosh. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Um, so happy to be here and part of this project. Um, 
I'm a story production fellow at ProPublica, and um, part of my job is I get to commission illustrators and photographers for stories, um, including Amy's series. Um, and so I'm just gonna um, ask folks uh, one by one some, some questions um, and excited to, to spend this time hearing about, about the art. Um, so Mumta, this, this first question is for you. Um, the art in the story, the illustrations um, started with your beautiful, powerful photographs. Um, could you tell us some more about some of the decisions you made while photographing for this story and, and your goals for this story in particular? Sure. Um, so this was going to be a mixture of documentary photography and portraits. Uh, so Ka and Kyra and Drew and BJ were going to be the documentary styles. And I wanted to think about the portraits um, in a way that I wanted them to all sort of match each other. And so I had to decide between wanting to do natural light or bring in studio lights. And since we're in these COVID times, if I did, I brought in studio lighting, it would just take a lot more time to set up in people's homes and such. And I wasn't really sure um, how comfortable people wanted for me to be in their homes during this time. So I just decided to go with natural light. So if you notice all the photos, um, they're all window light. Uh, I actually prefer shooting with natural light anyway, um, but that's that was a choice for the portraits. And then for the documentary style, I knew that I would only have, I live in Tucson and, and the two subjects were up in Phoenix. So I really only had about maybe five or six hours with them over one day. Uh, so I really wanted to concentrate on getting as much many images and show their personalities in that time period. Thanks so much, Mamta. Um, I'm going to I'm going to move on to the illustrators, Erica and Kareem. Um, just wanted to say um, your portraits for this series were also um, so wonderful. And I'm so glad both of you um, can join us today. Um, and Kareem, I think we're meeting for the first time here. So just wanted to say great to meet you and great to see you again, Erica. Um, Erica and Kareem, um, could you each talk to us about your process for creating the illustrations based off of Mumta's wonderful photographs and, and what stood out to you um, when you saw the photographs? Um, and, and feel free to say anything else you'd like about um, about the illustration process too. Um, so I guess, um, Erica, could, could you answer first? Erica, I think you might be muted. First saw the photographs of Emery, I could tell pretty much from her expression that even with her several palsy, that she was a very vibrant young lady. I could tell that she had kind of, kind of an attitude to her, like a little of a little of a mouth diva, kind of of the mouth diva who we saw here for today. That she was high spirited, a very clever young lady, and. From what I was told that she has interest in music and art, ambition to be DJ. And so I felt it'd be a good idea to incorporate those within her um, illustration, help show off a bit of her personality. And when it comes to um, uh, Danelle and um, her mother, I could tell that they had a very strong bond the presence for the two of them, it was pretty mother-daughterly, familial, very comfortable with each other and very warm. It was certainly important to get the feeling of that correct, as well as emphasizing the, um, uh, well, as well as emphasizing their hobby because it seems like to me that they tend to probably do kind of dress up things often together a good way for them to be connected and likely have very interesting tastes as well. Thanks so much, Erica. Um, and for folks who have already read the story, the last illustration Erica was talking about was of um, 
uh, Carol and Janine um, with fans and kind of dressed up um, in a flapper style. Um, so if you haven't read the story, look out for that watercolor that Erica made. Um, Kareem, I'd love to know more about your illustration process as well. You want to do this? At the oh, my. Go ahead. Yeah, but. Oh, connectivity issues. Uh, there we go. Kareem, can you can you hear me? Can I hear me? Yeah, I think we can hear you now. Yeah, in case off and on. Right. Zoom. Yeah. Is yeah, it a what question? Kareem, could you could you say more about your illustration process and how you made the portraits? Uh oh. We might be having some tech issues here. So we, if, if we have some more time, I'd love to circle back to Kareem. Um, right, Kareem. Um, I think they, you know, they just wanted um, you to, to, to tell a little bit about what it was like when to work on the commissions, you know, like how, how perhaps we, we communicated Yeah, yeah, I try, yeah, I communicate. Well, see, he stood it to me. A Zoom. It was, uh, and I said, it's just like I, just like I keep in order to me, try to con contact for all the people was a mixed studio since the pandemic begins in 2019, since December last year. And now we're doing home, it's just the beginning. Yes. It's the new and, novel. And and for the for the portraits that you did, um, I communicated with you almost exclusively via Facebook Messenger. So Kareem got the photos sent from me and um, I would, I was I used to ask him like if 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 this was up his um his alley and um and he was basically receptive to any commission that I sent his way right Kareem how many do you remember how many total you did oh it was um uh, I don't actually know the number myself at the moment, but it was quite a few. And there were over a few weeks, um, I would often on my way to the studio where I, I worked on my own, I dropped off materials, sometimes color printouts if he needed them. Um, and he turned the commissions around based on those um, visuals. Uh, Pretty fast. Kareem is a just, very... like, just like I did these images for the people as I want to be released, but I did for the past couple months now. Yes, and you used and you used mostly acrylics and and Sharpie, correct? Yes, correct. Thanks so much, Stefan and Kareem. I'm I'm also uh, gonna have to wrap up, um, but I just wanted to give Rosie a chance um, to talk about um, the process. Um, if okay. I think we I think we have to kind of uh, leave it at that and hand it over to Rosie now.
Yeah, typical, typical difficulties on my Zoom. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. We understand. Everyone, one more question about or what? I think I think I think we're, we we uh, we can pass it on to Rosie now. Thank you all, um, Kareem. I'm glad you could make it on. Um, so uh, yeah, some of our process um, in making the Zoom screen illustration, um, which is the first one that we did for this story. Um, Shosh called me up. Uh, we know each other from college. Um, and she knew that I had connection to Make Studio um, and working with artists with disabilities and things really fell into place. Um, the next day uh, I was working on our virtual studio call um, and knew that there would be artists there who might be open to working collaboratively on that illustration, um, which we did. Um, so we all chose the different uh, Zoom squares that we wanted to work on um, and chatted and kind of compared work as we drew. Um, and then I put it all together on Photoshop that evening. Um, so that was like our entry point into working with this story. Um, and from there we kept getting more images um, and artists were matched up to which pieces they would work on um, across several weeks. Um, and something that I wanted to share about artists um, making art for, for journalism and stories um, is that it was really fun and a, a great opportunity for Make Studio to connect with ProPublica um, and talk about making journalism more accessible. Um, and I also hope that through, through this platform to spread the message that artists with disabilities are ready to do commissions for any type of stories. Um, just as journalism needs to include artists, um, or, sorry, needs to include people with disabilities in all their stories. Um, artists with disabilities can also do art for all types of stories. Um, Thanks so much, so, Rosie. Want to share that message. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad. Yeah, we're ending on that on that note because I think it's really important. Um, and just thank you to um, everyone who who just shared. Um, and now I'm gonna kick it to the to the next segment. Oh, Shosh, thank you so much. And Rosie, just so you know, that is um, something that we've talked about a lot while working on this project. Um, and, and we've talked with Becca about it a lot too. Um, so to be continued on that discussion. Uh, but that was great. We're gonna share resources with you in a follow-up email after the event. If you wanna learn more about Make Studio um, or about Mamta's work. And I know everyone's really excited to offer advice and tips if anyone's looking for that. We just didn't have, um, didn't, no, there's never enough time. We didn't have enough time. Um, to do that. So next we're going to be segueing to speak with Becca Monteleone, along with two of my editors, Jill Jordan Spitz of the Arizona Daily Star and T. Christian Miller of ProPublica. Uh, it's very fitting that the four of us are talking for this last part because we have spent a lot of time talking and working together throughout this project. So T, over to you. Yeah, I think you have to unmute yourself. I was already launched into such a genius speech. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name's T. Miller. Uh, I was one of the editors on this project, um, along with Jill, uh, Jordan Spitz. And um, I want to just kind of briefly pick up on exactly what Rosie was saying, which is that a lot of what um, our drove this project was our interest in making this project more accessible to the folks uh, about whom the story was and also making sure that there are people, uh, that there was plenty of participation by people from the community in our stories. And so I thought it might be helpful um, tonight, I'll kind of be a moderator here, to ask some questions of folks uh, about what their roles were in, in thinking about accessibility and where we can go as, as journalists trying to communicate a message uh, and trying to interact with our audiences. So. I'm going to ask um, Becca Monteleon uh, was as a professor at the University of Toledo um, in disability studies. She was our, 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 the person who led our transformation, uh, led the charge into using plain language 
Um, so what we would do is we wrote the story in original English, and then we would turn it over to Becca, who would then render it into uh, plain language to make it um, accept more accessible. So uh, Becca, this was your, your first time uh, working in journalism. We, we do believe this was the first time that an investigative journalism uh, uh, was, was done in plain language. So tell us about uh, a little bit about what it was like uh, having this assignment. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Becca Monteleone. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a, a white woman with dark brown hair. I'm sitting in front of a bookcase and a window, if you can't see me as well as you'd like to. Um, so, so plain language translations are something that I have been doing for a long time, for five or six years, right? But it's always been for technical documents, you know, things I use in my own research, like consent forms or research summaries that are written in, in an accessible way or, you know, fact sheets for disability organizations. Um, so like T mentioned, this was the first time I'd ever ventured into the world of journalism. And, and we do think this is the first time any major media outlet has done this kind of translational work for accessibility. Um, Amy and I originally connected over storytelling. Um, I was working at Detour Company Theater, who partnered with ProPublica over the summer for a storytelling event. And then we got to talking about um, thinking through, you know, how people with intellectual disabilities can be sources for this kind of work, but also consumers of news as well. And I think, I mean, I think everyone agrees that when you're having a conversation, we should center the perspectives of the people who are most impacted, but in, in intellectual disability, that's so rarely the case. And so it's often because kind of these conversations are structured to be difficult to understand, whether that's, um, you know, a certain kind of writing gets valued as being good writing, and often that's very complicated writing, or, you know, in something like disability services, there's a lot of jargon, there's a lot of acronyms, it's, it's a complicated system, right? So these conversations are designed to be difficult to understand. And plain language is about making sure that how something is written down doesn't exclude certain readers from being able to participate in the conversation. So whether that's through things like simplified sentences or using familiar words, explaining jargon, you know, using bullet points or active tense, um, all of these are kind of the tools that we use. And doing this sort of for, for this kind of investigative reporting, brought to light a couple of new and, and I think really interesting challenges, right? So, you know, for example, you can't change what people say, right? So, so someone gives you a quote, you can't, you can't quote them differently just because you're writing a, a plain language translation. So working with the team here on how to make sure that the journalism was held to the same standard that the original text was, while also being able to be consumed by a lot more different kinds of readers um, was such kind of an interesting challenge. And, and of course this story, the plain language version went through the same review process as the original text. It was editorially reviewed and it was, it was legally reviewed as well. And I think T can speak to that a little bit further. Um, and so what's really interesting here is that, you know, we had a lot of conversations. We were worried about these journalistic standards, but what we found here is that it is totally possible. And so that should not be a barrier to making this kind of translation or this kind of writing uh, more available more broadly. Yeah, and, and, and just to echo uh, what Becca said is um, the stories that we did in plain language were every bit as rigorous and nuanced and complicated as our original stories, but they were just rendered in a way that made it as easier to consume for, for its audience. So one of the things that if you're thinking about doing work in, in plain language is, is it, it is possible to sort of maintain kind of your journalistic standard, wherever they may be, at the same time as making your work um, more accessible. Uh, so I'm going to um, have our, our time is short. I'm going to uh, go over to Amy. Now, Amy Silverman was the reporter on this project. Um, Amy, can you tell us a little bit about the um, kind of the origin story? Why did you want to do this story and, and um, what did you think of it? Well, I wanted to do this project because I had known for a long time that Arizona has a phenomenal reputation for providing services for people with developmental disabilities. And a lot of people do get good, good services like um, Adiba Emery's mom was saying. But I've also heard for a long time that, that there are a lot of people who struggle. 
And uh, two, almost two years ago, uh, when a woman um, with a developmental disability who lives at an intermediate care facility in Phoenix gave birth to a baby boy, surprising basically the world, um, the, the beehive kind of opened up. And there's been a lot of discussion about services and institutions. And certainly we understand now as a society that institutions can be problematic, uh, but Arizona, almost everybody with a developmental disability who's in the system here lives either at home or in a small community setting. And so we wanted to see what life was like for them. So that, that was really where we came, came at it from. And what were your interests in, in the accessibility side of things? My interest in the accessibility? Um, well, you know, that's really been an evolutionary process for me personally. Um, as the parent of a child with Down syndrome, I've had to kind of shift the way I think about writing about um, Sophie and our family and disability from, from me writing about her to her having her own voice and expressing herself. And so that's why I really wanted to focus the reporting on the people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. But as that process on Enrolled, and as we worked on a storytelling event together this summer with Becca, we realized that it wasn't enough to, to interview people with uh, developmental disabilities and put them front and center that way. We needed to make the journalism accessible to them once, once we'd created it. And, and we're very lucky to have uh, Becca in our extended family and, and she has done plain language translations before. So it was just a natural fit. And, and I can say to any journalist folks who are out there, a lot of uh, Becca's translations were admired far and above anything that I edited. Because they or that, were so or that I wrote. <laughs> they were so direct and so easy to understand. So uh, they caused quite a, a stir in the journalism world and a lot of people paid attention to the fact that you can do a story like this. Um, so now let me turn to Jill, who is the editor of, of Star. Um, Jill, uh, it's not an easy time for news organizations in these days. Um, your organization, The Star, devoted quite a, amount of, a bit of time and resources and effort. I don't know if you guys saw the story in the Sunday paper, but it took up six full newspaper pages of the Sunday paper, which is a tremendous amount of resources to dedicate to a single story. So Jill, tell us a little bit about why you, know, you thought it was important um, to do that. Well, as, as Amy said, it started out as a, a topic that we both felt passionately about. We both have kids with disabilities. We both see that sometimes the world doesn't see kids like ours. Um, sometimes somebody with a disability may be slow to answer a question, maybe hard to understand, maybe gets too close to the person talking. And sometimes that makes people uncomfortable. And so they tend to talk around the person. And it, what, what does your son think about this? instead of asking, asking the person, it happens all the time. And the other thing that happens in journalism a lot is hero worship of parents. Aren't you just such a wonderful person to love this inherently unlovable children or child, which is so unintentionally offensive, um, but really, really hurtful. Um, so Amy and I had wanted to sort of find a way to burst through that for a long time. And as we went down that road, as Amy said, the issue of making the journalism accessible to the people who are most affected by it became such an obvious need um, and something that we really wanted to do. So that benefits people like our kids, it benefits parents like us, but it benefits all journalists to understand these things, to learn these things. And so I wanted to involve all of our staff to help to get people involved and to help them see and learn what we're learning um, we want that knowledge to be shared broadly. And it's an important story in the end and big important stories deserve big important space. Um, so that part of it was the, the easiest decision of all really. That's great. Uh, we are approaching our, our 5 p.m. mark. Um, I did want to return to BJ though, who had um, wanted to bring up another point, I believe. BJ, you're on mute right now. Could you unmute yourself? Hi. Hi. Uh, a couple things. Um, I happen to have 10 years as the disability training coordinator for the state of Arizona. Part of my job was giving public presentations to DDD employees and support coordinators and supervisors about disabilities and about assistive technology like the AAC devices. 
And I just want you all to know, I'm thrilled with how the whole process went, how the interviews were done, how a group of people worked on the project and all the efforts at, at accessibility and doing the YouTube to share and to do the video and phone calls and have the transcripts and the chat. This is very, very unusual. I just want all the other families to realize that this effort is rarely made and coordinated so well. So I wanted to get that across, number one. Number two, um, DDD families don't know each other. I would love to meet uh, Deba and Emery and Kareem and everybody, but we are not like communities, like um, they call the deaf community or the blind community. In DDD, our problems are so unique and individual. We don't have the connections and there are no groups. There are no social ways for us to get together. And from the story that I read and that I get to see tonight, oh my gosh, I just wish so many of the DDD families that we had a way to share our stories with each other and talk to each other. So I wanted to encourage if anybody wants to reach out or if there's an email, you can give my email address and whatever, you know, we can have something really, really informal, formal, like, you know, my email or whatever, but I can or, tell or you. Or BJ, people could follow you on Twitter, right? Yeah, I'm on Twitter. I'm Cobalt on Twitter, Cobalt123. And yeah, I talk a lot. Um, anyway, I also want everybody to know, and this, the photographers and the writers and the accessibility team, all that may not realize um, we're an old experienced DDD family because Drew is 41. Most of the DDD families you think about, their children are much younger. They're still in grade school, middle school, high school. People don't think of people being DDD when they're old, like Drew and I. But I can tell you right now, every family that participated, the reason if we have success, I absolutely guarantee is because their families do not give up. Their families must learn to be really good advocates and being a really good advocate, it was a joy. I'm sure every family, Amy and Mumta, told you how grateful we are that someone cared and gave us a voice. And it meant a lot to me. And even though my son was having a hard time today uh, because he's declining since we started our interviews, he is so proud of this. And I'm sure Emery must be and every person who participated. So I just really wanted to say thank you, thank you. Well, thank you, BJ, and thank you for um, your time and, and, uh, and the availability for uh, both you uh, Andrew, to kind of be a part of this story. We really appreciate um, the risks you took in, in talking with us. Uh, and also um, glad to find out that it, uh, it didn't turn out so seriously. But you know, every step that you can make out there, putting your voice out there as an advocate for you and for Drew uh, is, is a great one. And if we were able to do help with that in some way, I, I'm great. Um, we've had some, some, some questions come in. So um, first I'll start with a question from uh, Joy uh, about uh, plain language. Uh, Becca, if, if we wanted to find out how to write in plain language or to use plain language, are there resources out there available? Um, classes, internet sites, anything you might be able to, to, to recommend? Yeah, thank you. So I, I wrote some recommendations in the Q&A directly if people need, you know, the, the text for what I'm, I'm going to recommend here. Um, there, it's not a super formalized field as of yet, but there are some really great resources. So one thing that I always direct people to is uh, a, a, it's just a PDF guide called Am I Making Myself Clear? Um, that was published by MenCap, which is a, a UK disability uh, nonprofit. Um, that's just a really nice introduction about what accessible writing means. And it's really clear about, it's not about censoring, it's not about removing content. Um, it, it gives you some like really clear guidance on how you might try it out yourself and some really good examples too. Uh, and then my other suggestion would be just to try to find some plain language translations and read them and become familiar with the form, um, especially if you're able to uh, compare kind of original text versus plain language. So of course we have 
this series of stories here that you could could read and do that comparison work. Um, another that comes to mind immediately was um, last summer, a book came out called The Disability Visibility Reader. It was published by um, Alice Wong. And there's a plain language translation of that done by Sarah Luterman, who is uh, an, an autistic journalist herself. Um, that might be a really good uh, another good kind of source to just kind of get a sense of what this actually means. So those would be my, my immediate suggestions. And I'm hoping to actually work on a guide of some kind in the next year. So stay tuned. Right. So, so keep your eye out. Um, we have a second question coming in from uh, Hezi. Uh, Hezi would like to know uh, what ProPublica and the Daily Star believe is the scope for making uh, non-disability related content available in accessible format. So I'm interpreting that to mean um, sports stories and police stories and government stories, the kind of stuff that, that we kind of cover day in and day out. Um, and then second, uh, the Hezzy would like to know journalists thoughts about not only using community engagement to make content accessible, but also to employ and train uh, diverse stakeholders, including persons with disabilities, intellectual disabilities to co-produce journalism. Um, uh, Jill, I'll turn that over to you first and you can toss it back to me if. Uh, yeah, I, I really think we are onto something wonderful with plain language in journalism. I think in general, not just stories involving disability, but stories about city council meetings and sports stories, a lot of them are filled with jargon. Uh, they're written in a language that makes sense to us as journalists and probably to nobody else. Uh, and they could be better. And I think plain language um, shows us a different way. I think a really good example, T and I wrote a column uh, in the, that, that ran with the story explaining why we did plain language, why we did the story in general. And truly the plain language version was so much better than our pithy journalistic version. Um, I mean, night and day difference. So I, I think we're onto something wonderful. And I really, really, really want this to be the beginning of a discussion about how this sort of language can influence journalism in general. And uh, on your second question, Hezzy, um, journalists uh, across the country and journalism organizations across the country have certainly become uh, much more aware of the need to represent a diversity of voices uh, in our newsrooms and in our news pages. Um, we are always looking for opportunities to employ uh, uh, all sorts of people from all sorts of backgrounds. Um, and that of course would include folks with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, I cannot right now um, point to any particular examples of that occurring, but there are organizations out there um, that are promoting uh, sort of writing and tools of writing for, for um, people with intellectual uh, disabilities. Uh, and Hopefully those folks will want to write about news and we are um, would love to be able to kind of shepherd uh, people with that sort of interest along into the world of journalism. Uh, let's see if we have any other questions coming through. Oh, um, from uh, Bruce Rosen just wants to kind of point out that um, Legal documents in New York City have to be written in plain language, and also jargon is just bad writing. Um, and the recommendations, you know, never, never talk down or write down to one's audience. And, and, and Becca, do you want to talk a little bit about that specifically? About the idea of, you know, is plain language just language which is, um, you know, a third grade level language, for instance? Like, what do you um, uh, consider? On, think about that. Right. So I think this is a really great question because plain language is in some ways audience specific, right? So if it's, if the concern is using words that your audience will be familiar with, you need to know who your audience is. Um, so there's not, a, a, again, there isn't a ton of kind of official guidance on plain language as an accessibility tool versus, you know, how it's defined in, in for example, in, um, you know, governmental situations, right? But there is some, some 
kind of differences that seem to be emerging, right? So some of them do have to do with, you know, what sort of grade level attribution can you give it, which um, that's language that I try to avoid when I'm talking about plain language, um, because I think that there's sometimes some confusion that when you say you're writing something at a third grade level, that means that I can't include anything that would be inappropriate to tell a third grader, right? Which is certainly not um, this sort of goal of plain language, right? It is, as I mentioned, never about kind of censoring. It's not about condescending down to people, but it is about recognizing that someone's reading ability shouldn't determine whether or not they have access to a conversation. Um, Right, so uh, I can't give like tons of great specifics, right? So there's some suggestion that plain language is somewhere around a fifth to sixth grade level in the accessibility conversation. And then there's a sort of another version of this called easy read, which is somewhere closer to a, a second grade level. Um, but again, those are not sort of attributions that I like to, to try to use um, because they're certainly not always helpful either, right? So again, it's, it's about knowing who your audience is um, and what you want to communicate to them and doing it um, in a way that will actually reach them. Right, exactly. Um, uh, Bruce points out uh, some of the best writing is for children. One is introducing concepts that does not make it childish, which is exactly right. Um, we have, we are joined by uh, Cassie Camacho, I believe, uh, who was one of the folks we featured in our stories. Uh, and um, Cassie, are you there? Oh, hey, there you are. Uh, would you like to um, address uh, what it was like being a part of the stories, being interviewed by reporters and, and how you felt about the experience? It was fun about being in stories. Yeah. I like the sto my story that Amy wrote about me. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people liked it about the story that she wrote about me. She made it inspiring. And did you like the uh, all the other um, people in the story being able to talk yes. folks with, with um, developmental disabilities? Yes. And what is that story going to do? Is it just going to, like, what is the story going to do? If I could predict that, I would be making a lot more money than I am right now. Um, my my hope is that this that this story will go out to the world and that people will read it today, tomorrow, and months from now, and that they will it will make them think about how do I reach more people in the articles uh, that I write. Um, journalists think that their work matters and that it's important and that we're exposing something that is important for people to know. Um, and part of that is we want as many people to know as possible. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you being in part of the story helps us to make the case to mm -hmm. other journalists, to other folks um, with developmental disabilities, that um, this is a, 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 a combination of communication and, and reporting that can make a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. I like the story about me, it was very good. What did you think about it, Amy? What, well, I loved getting to meet you, even though it was on Zoom, and getting to talk to you about your life. And I also wanted to add that, you know, there are a lot of people out there who think that if you have a developmental disability, you automatically get services. And, mm -hmm. and you know very well that that's not the case. No, um, it's not. Yeah, so I, it was so valuable for you to literally put a face on the story so that people really understand what your life is like and what other people's lives are like. So I'm, I'm just really grateful to you for that, Cass. And thank, and thank you for doing the, sto the story. Is it going to be, um, I think you told me that it was going to be online. Is it online yet? It's online and I have a copy to mail to you too. Yeah. Oh, you do? You mail it to my address or to email? Yeah, let's talk on email later and we'll figure it all out. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, and for folks who, for folks who do want to, um, and, and Cassie, just so you know, the, the, the name of the series is State of, State of Denial, like D-E-N-I-A-L. Um, and so if you look it up by State of Denial and ProPublica or The Star, uh, it'll bring you to the online presentation. And I hope Amy does send you a copy of um, the, the, the newspaper itself, because uh, there was an extraordinary uh, job done by the, the layout folks and the, and the people at the Daily Star to make it a very beautiful presentation. 
And I it think, a- oh, sorry, Cassie, go ahead. All right, well. There we go, sorry. Okay, cool. It, it, was, it was a good story. I, I really like it, and thank you again, Amy. You're welcome. Can you just tell us super quickly, Cassie, what are all those awards behind you? All of my awards? Oh, ice skating, cheerleading, bowling, track, and swimming. Wow. For Special awesome. Olympics, right? Yeah, yeah, Special Olympics. Doesn't Sophie do Special Olympics, your daughter? She does in normal times. Uh, should we turn it back over to, to Bina now? I'm going to have to go. Is that okay? Because I'm of course. I have a Zoom um, at 630. You're, yeah, you're the busiest person in show business. Thank I you know. so much for Cassie for joining us. Well, thank for you being again. Here, Cassie. Thank you. Nice meeting all you guys. Talk to you soon. You too. Well, I think I'm wrapping it up here. Um, thank you to Amy, Becca, T, and Jill, um, and everybody who participated in our event and helped us uh, make this evening possible. And thanks, of course, to all of you who attended. We also want to send out a special shout out and thank you to Norma Coyle, an editor at the Arizona Daily Star, Ariana Tobin, ProPublica's engagement editor, and Rick Wiley, the Star's photo editor, for also making this project possible. So if there are any last thoughts you'd like to drop into the chat or send to us via text, that number is 520-329-7530. And journalists are still standing by. We are here anytime you want to talk to us. We would love to hear from you even after the event is over. Um, if you would like a copy of this video or if you would like to screen it to a community that you know, like a group home or a day program, just tell us in the chat or you can text, call, or email us. We are listening and um, you know how to reach us with any other feedback. We will also be sending out an email after this event uh, with all of the links that we mentioned here and additional resources for learning more about Make Studio and and doing your own storytelling. So thanks everybody. Good night and uh, thanks for being here. Thanks okay, all. thank you. Bye. Thank you, it's nice knowing you. <laughs>